you've probably seen that the NCAA finally submitted its notice of allegations to the University of Michigan, and we need to understand why the timing is so important and why it is so interesting that they, A, finally got this thing done, and they sent it August 22nd, some two weeks after we found out about Jim Harbaugh's show cause penalty for recruiting violations in a separate matter. I think that as we continue to find out more about just how deep this notice validation goes, we probably should talk about the process and what that means. So what usually happens in the NCAA infraction case when major violations are alleged to have been committed, they spend their time gathering their evidence, they spend their time stating facts, and then they come down with what they think is a decision. They send that to the University of Michigan in this case. They can either accept this, right, and then go on with the punishment such as it is, or they can get a hearing and get 90 days to respond to the notice of allegation. According to NBC, the document states that seven members of the 2023 Michigan football program, including current head coach Sharon Moore, are accused of violating NCAA rules. Moore is specifically cited for allegedly deleting 52 texts from a thread with Connor Stallions, who is the subject of a forthcoming documentary um, last October. Those messages have since been recovered, and Moore has said out loud he looks forward to people being able to see them. Why this is interesting for, for him in particular is he could face a level two violation for deleting the messages in the first place, but if they were re recovered, we'll see. There could be a sig uh, significant penalty for that. Could be a suspension from the NCAA could be seen as a repeat violator because you'll know that he had to or they had the self-imposed sitting out last year when news was reported that he had violated recruiting by uh, recruiting rules during the COVID season. A lot of people were violating recruiting rules during the COVID season. I mean, it's it's a pandemic. That part for me is incidental, but the, the repeat violator part, that's the thing that you might get hung up on. And that's the thing that I actually hold some weight here. So. We shall see what the severity of these things are. But let's also remember that Jim Harbaugh, Chris Partridge, Denard Robinson, Stallions are all accused of committing level one violations. Former uh, Michigan coaches Jesse Minter, Steve Klinkscale also accused of recruiting violations. It's just been this and that, right, uh, all the way down. So the more interesting part about this, again, isn't that they sent the notice of allegations. It's that... The notice of allegations was sent on August 22nd, which is a Sunday. This is, of course, one week before Michigan and the rest of college football opens its season, right? And it is just days before this documentary uh, coming out on Netflix basically is going to tell the wider world about this case, about Connor Stallions and the sign stealing. You know the story by now, but let's just make sure that people are on the same page. Connor Stallions is accused of <laughs> paying for tickets to go to games, to scout signs of rival teams, to record them, to decipher them, and then to stand on the sideline next to play callers, um, and in, in some cases we think pl uh, players, and tell them what play is coming next. Okay, It's illegal to do that using electronic equipment. If you do that, sight uns like you're citing it yourself from across the sideline during the game, that's fair play. Where we get to the cheater part of this is where people are very upset. And then add to this, again, Michigan went 15-0 and last year. Michigan won the national championship last year. And Connor Stallion did this for at least a year, maybe longer, right, depending on how you want to go with this. And has really been painted as an undesirable person. Uh, and I'm like, okay. I don't really have that sort of energy for it. I think it's just funny how this is all gone and how it's being played out all across the country, frankly. But the notice of allegations for me is more significant with the 90 days. Why is it more significant with the 90 days? It is more significant with the 90 days because 90 days from August 22nd is Friday, November 22nd, which is one day before Michigan plays Northwestern, but it's also one week before Michigan is supposed to play Ohio State. And that is where this kind of gets a little bit funky. There are those that believe that the NCAA is out to get Michigan. There are those that believe that the NCAA is a farce. There are those that believe that the NCAA is doing its job, which is to do these things on behalf of its members. Michigan is one of those members. 
you enforce the bylaws as they are, as they are written. You want to change them, go about that process in a different way. Um, we also have helmet to helmet, uh, uh, headset to helmet technology this year, which I think has basically eliminated the need for signs at all. And I think that this is one of those unintended consequences about that decision, but also spurred that up. I know there are folks that don't believe that one has anything to do with the other, but I tend to because I'm not going to be sending signs to anybody if I can just talk into a headset and tell you what is coming. That way, you got to hack the communication. I'm really, I just wanted to do this segment because I wanted to do an explainer about this rather than give an opinion about this. Um, because I think understanding the process is as important as any opinion that you're going to get because you need to have the context to understand the opinion that you're going to get. And if you don't have that context and you don't have an understanding of what is at stake here, you know, then, then we have a problem. So if, for instance, the punishment that the NCAA wants to see from Sharon Moore is a show cause, uh, okay, if it is suspension, all right, that's a little bit more severe, but... I'm not sure what you could do at this point that is really going to satisfy anybody in as far as punishment for Michigan for what Connor Stallions did, who resigned, by the way, last November is not really a part of the program. I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by, okay, assume that Sharon Moore is suspended for three games, four games. Is that enough for you? You'd be able to answer that in the comments. Uh, by the way, if you like the channel, please consider subscribing to it. We're on our way to 100,000 subscribers. It's very cool. Uh, that's my national championship. If you want to see Sharon Moore suspended for the entire year, I think that's excessive. And I also don't know that it's going to matter all that much if he gets to coach during practice, right? And you have acting head coaches because your coordinators are both going to be there. You're going to have Wink Martindale, who was nowhere near Michigan last year, calling on the defense. And you're going to have Kurt Campbell, who's basically been not talked about at all within any of these violations, which is really remarkable, uh, given some thought. Although, I'm sure that there's a bit to this with Kurt Campbell. The point there that I would make is, I don't think that the people that want to see something happen to Michigan will have something in mind that makes them feel better other than an apology. And I don't think you're, just, I don't think you're gonna get one of those because you're not obliged to get one of those. I'm also reminded that Jim Harbaugh was suspended for six games last year. It didn't matter. Uh, they won every game they played. That's a fact, right? I'm also curious about how this plays with the players because last year and even in the previous two years, it didn't seem to matter much to them. They went out and they played. I realize that there are those folks that believe that the players know what play is coming to so they could react the way that they're supposed to, to which I would say, dog, I'm running ISO. Stop me. Meet me in the hole. You know, like there's still an aspect of this that you got to be able to block and tackle. You have to be able to play the sport. You have to be better than the person across from you. It's one of the reasons that we love watching offensive lines go after defensive lines. It's why we were all enthusiastic about Georgia Tech, more or less looking like Michigan. They held the ball. They limited the possessions. They ran the clock and they mauled that Florida State defensive line. That was there was nothing they could do about that. Nothing. If you know that they're going to run the ball and by the third quarter you know they're running the damn ball and you still can't stop them, that's got nothing to do with knowing the plays. And that's got everything to do with you just getting washed down by one of the best offensive lines in football. As a matter of fact, the, the take to come out of that is maybe Georgia Tech has a Joe Moore Award winning offensive line. Think about what they have at quarterback. Lahane's King is good. He's not great. Think about how you're being introduced to guys like Jamal Haynes, right? Think about how... Going into this game, you didn't really have a household name coming out of Georgia Tech, and now might be the quarterback just because that's the quarterback, but I think the way that they played is sustainable, right? They can If they can run the ball like they ran the ball on Florida State, yeah, we're talking about Georgia Tech being a damn good football team, making it hard for everybody they play, probably winning more games than they, than they lose, and that's what Michigan became after the 2020 season. They became that team. It's really difficult to beat that team because they could run the ball on you, and they were sound on defense. I realize that I'm kind of getting away from the point on this, but I do want to stress, I still think you you got to be able to stop it, man. Like, I play a lot, well, I'm not going to go with that, because people want to dump on video games, but if you played EA Sports College Football 25, you probably wouldn't dump on it. You know what this person is doing. You know that they're either going to run that quarterback out, 
or they're going to try to use Quinshawn Quinshawn Judkins spin move, or they're going to try to go over the top of your head with somebody like Mike Evans, right? There are just guys that it matters. Players, not plays. Players, not scheme. Players, not preparation. Like, all those things help players make plays. But at the end of the day, if I got Deion Sanders and you don't, I'm throwing the ball to Deion Sanders. If I got Ollie Gordon and you don't, I'm handing the ball to Ollie Gordon. That's that's not here nor there. That's fundamental competitive play. I realize that the cheating and the scandal has shrouded that, and I'm willing to say, okay, cool, I understand that part. But in as far as this is concerned, man, I want to watch Michigan play ball. I want to watch everybody play ball. This off-the-field crap that we're still dealing with and probably going to deal with because Michigan's probably going to drag this all the way to whenever they want to drag it to, I can't wait for it to not be what we're talking about because we are playing ball now. And yet, the day after we started playing ball, we had an outstanding upset of a top 10 team. We had money in the bag with Montana State, and SMU tried everything they could to try to lose to Nevada. We're still talking about this, all right? That is my take at the end of all of this. Let's play ball.